At this time, I have the honor to present to you the moral leader of our nation. I have the pleasure to present to you Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. What up, everybody? David D. hanging out with you. And where do we begin? We're talking about the year 2013, 50 years ago, August 28th in a place called Washington, D.C., in front of the Lincoln Memorial. A young man by the name of Martin Luther King delivered a historic speech. It was called I Have a Dream, and it's been immortalized all around the world. But behind, a, um, behind every good speech, there's a whole set of circumstances that we need to understand. What led up to it? What made the speech be one that is, you know, immortalized through time? Um, what was the political backdrop? What was the social settings? All those sorts of stuff. And this gentleman here that's next to me, his name is Gary Young. He's a well-known journalist, political analyst uh, from London, you know, Britain. <laughs> You'll tell by his accent. Uh, somebody who has done us the favor of chronicling all this information in this new book called The Speech, the story behind Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And it is chock full of information, so welcome to the show, Gary. How Thanks are you? Thanks very much. I'm great. Thanks for having me, Daryl. We were just joking uh, before we came on air about that, that crazy interview that they did with Fox, mm. you know, and the guy was like, you know, the lady was like, how do you as a Muslim write about Jesus? So, <laughs> you know, in that spirit, we have to go, how do you as a Briton write about Martin Luther King? Well, I mean, the thing is, Martin Luther King is kind of international property, you know, in a, in a serious way. I learned about that speech. I grew up in a town 30 miles north of London. Mm -hmm. My parents are from Barbados. Uh, they moved to England in 61. Right. Uh, so I was born in England. We studied that speech at school, at high school. When they I was 13, 14, we, we, uh, we watched it on TV. We talked about the conditions that produced it and all that stuff. I was about 13, 14 years old. That's a global speech. I remember... Uh, while reporting on uh, the plight of the gypsies in uh, Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. This would have been in 2002, just before I came to the States. Uh, and they have a terrible time there. They're incredibly, the level of discrimination against Roma or gypsies is huge. Right. I'm drinking vodka with this, uh, with this guy who's an elder in the Roma community, and he says, what we need is our Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. We need a dream, we need a speech. So... He's international property. Uh, he's, he, he couldn't have come from anywhere else but America. America still, he's still American, he's still African American, but the world claims him. And African Americans should be proud of that. Right. So I come <clears throat> uh, to, to this and to him. Uh, uh, partly, I, I'm sure that being black gave me an interest and a, an investment in these things. Right. But um, as a global citizen, uh, uh, King is one of those things. I have a six-year-old son, and yeah. I say it's yours, but you got to share it. Okay. King's yours, but you also, you have to you, you have to share it with the world. Well, you know it's interesting. You mentioned something that might have gone over a lot of people's heads. You said that when you were coming up in school, mm. you studied the speech and you studied the social conditions leading up to it. And many of the schools, including the ones I went to, and I went to good schools, they didn't do that, and increasingly so. We're having schools that are kind of like they'll they'll play the speech and call it a day, mm. um, and they've kind of uh, removed the politics behind you know away from it. They've uh, kind of commodified the speech, mm. and it's used as a tool of convenience. Mm. So when we're fighting for social justice, well, you know Martin Luther King said, oh, you know, don't judge a man by his color of his mm. skin and all that sort of stuff. But with that being said, I want to go back to what you really. Um, break out in the book, which is 1963. There's so much stuff going on, and I think people kind of forget 
um, what was leading up to the speech, what was happening right around the speech, and what took place afterwards. And so since this is like our 50th anniversary of the speech, mm. let's set the mood, 1963. Well, I think an important place to start is globally. That globally America was in the middle of the Cold War. Okay. Uh, it was running around the world, uh, Kennedy at the time, uh, trying to export its version of democracy, trying to uh, uh, front up against the Soviet Union and say, we are a democracy. We, this is something that we do. You're a totalitarian dictatorship. People can't choose how to live in your country. That's not what we do. Right. They set themselves up as a shining city on the hill. That's what was happening in the Cold War. Meanwhile, there were the anti-colonial movements that were building... Uh, uh, steam. In 1960, Harold Macmillan goes to apartheid South Africa and he says the winds of change are blowing through this continent, mm. whether you like it or not. And they blow like a hurricane all through uh, Africa and uh, parts of Asia and parts of the Caribbean. People are having the same conversations they are in America. How do we get to vote? Right. How do we establish ourselves as citizens in our own country? How do we get this oppression off our bags? So globally, there is this uh, tension of uh, the, uh, the Cold War, and then there is this uh, momentum of the um, uh, anti-colonial movement. And that, much of that comes to a head in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, in uh, the spring of 63, where King leads a march um, or demonstrations which are mostly of children, children as young as six. And the world can see, because technology is also a technological moment. TV is just really exploding. Really exploding, both nationally and internationally. And in Birmingham, people can see children being knocked off their feet by uh, hoses. They can, see gun, uh, they can see dogs being set on them. They can see Bull Connor and his big stick... And this is going, the, the shots of Birmingham, they're on the front page of Pravda in the Soviet Union. Mm. They are being beamed into everybody's house in America, including people in the North and the West. Um, uh, Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State, the US Secretary of State at the time says, our enemies are gleeful, our allies are embarrassed. So this plays directly into the civil rights, uh, into the Cold War and, uh, and so on. And Birmingham changes everything. Mm. And it changes everything because at the end of Birmingham, there is a violent response. Birmingham changes everything, not least because um, the Klan decide to bomb uh, the motel where King was staying and King's brother's house. And after these bombings, African Americans respond. Um, uh, they throw rocks at the police. There's, there's, a, there's a riot, there's an uprising. And suddenly, the idea that black people may respond to this violence with violence scares the Kennedy administration and the civil rights leadership. Hmm. Kennedy goes on TV, announces... Uh, uh, he does like an Obama speech. Yeah. You know, like when Obama had to finally address the Trayvon, this right. is Kennedy 50 years before that. Exactly. He, he has no choice at this moment if he's going to fend off what he believes to be uh, uh, the worst. And in the 10 weeks after that speech, in 156 cities in America, um, there were 760 demonstrations, 14,000 arrests. Wow. It's like a bushfire, which is spreading all 14, over the country. 14,000 arrests. 14,000 arrests. Wow. And um, in 10 weeks. Wow. Now, also in 63, Medgar Evers gets killed. Mm. And, and that becomes a major spark as well. Right. I mean, there is, there is an incredible day, actually, an incredible 24-hour period when... You see the pace and the scale of the changes that are taking place. It starts in the morning with Alabama Governor George Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door in Tuscaloosa and refusing to let in two black students. Right. Is this where he says f segregation now, segregation now, segregation forever? Or? The, well, that was at the beginning of the year. That's that how, the the year begin, how, how the year begins. And then in, on June, uh, June 11th, he... Um, this is him performing that in, okay. in reality. And the federal troops, um, basically Kennedy's emissary has to 
push him aside, the kids go in. Uh, that's in the in the morning. Wow. In the afternoon, Kennedy decides that he has to give this civil rights. He has to propose civil rights legislation. All of his advisors say, don't bother, don't do it. He had thought about it in case the Wallace thing went bad. It didn't go bad, so they're like, just, just leave it alone. And he says, no, I've got, I've got to do it. So he goes on TV with a half written speech. He has to improvise uh, the second half of it and says, we have to address this. We can't just carry on like this. That's in the evening. Mary Evers stays up and watches it with her kids in bed. Uh, kids go to sleep. Mega comes back in the early hours of the next morning, puts the key in the door under the uh, honeysuckle bush just across the road, Baron de la Beckwith, sniper rifle, shoots so Mary Evers. So he gets killed the day after. Well, he gets, it's within 24 hour period, right. it's, it, but it's in the early morning. He gets killed right. kind of just after midnight. All of that happens in one day. Wow. So that's the kind of, that's the, and that is, uh, I'm going to say three months before, it's June the 12th, the march is on August 28th, the June, July, about 10 weeks before the demonstration. So that's the scale at which things are moving. Let's go to the march. Mm. Now, as I said in the beginning, we immortalize this speech. I have a dream, you know, the whole nine. And you point out in the book, that first of all, many people don't know mm. the context of that speech because he says a whole lot of things. Mm. You also point out that um, he wasn't even going to do I have a dream. Right. That's the whole thing. Like, this was like some freestyle stuff. Yeah. So let's talk about that and how he actually winds up uh, inserting those immortal words. Well, um, I mean, uh, and that's one of the beautiful stories, actually, I think, of, of the book. So the night before the, the march, Wyatt T. Walker, one of his key aides, says, don't do the I have From a dream thing. From the SELC. From the SELC, the Southern, Southern Christian Church. Leadership Conference. He says, don't, don't do the I have a dream thing. It's trite. It's cliche. You know, you, you, you want to raise your game a bit. And he's already done this a few times. King, King had already done it a few times. He'd done it in Detroit three months earlier um, at a big demonstration. He'd done it in Chicago just a week earlier mm. um, at, a, at a fundraiser. And um, uh, both White T. Walker and I think Andrew Young say to King, we want to go, go with something a little bit different. In the background, there is also this jockeying for position between the different civil rights groups. And one of the issues becomes, when is King going to speak? Because many of them see him as a dilettante. Right. So the question is, when is King going to speak? And um, how long is he going to speak? They don't want him to be a keynote speaker, so they don't want him to go to the end. And then Bayard Rustin, who organizes the march, says, which one of you want to follow him? And then they all step back, because no one wants to follow King. Right? Right. It's like, and we often forget about Bayard Rustin. Mm. You know, this is a... This is a guy that, in my opinion, has been written out of history, mm -hmm. and he has so many uh, interesting angles. I mean, we do a whole show on him, but gay, mm. that's the first thing a lot of people don't know, yeah. uh, or, or they forget, you know, mm. because we had this whole battle around gay rights and all that, and Bayard Rustin, major organizer. Yeah. Uh, and he was also down with the Communist Party. Right. So um, that's a whole other... He's communist, conscientious yeah. objector during the Second World War. Yeah. I mean, he was a kind of interesting guy, righteous, somewhat frivolous. And, um, a, and a lot of the phrases that we use today, speaking truth to power, is mm, him. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. so a lot of the phrases that we use, that's him speak. That's Very the, much. I mean, a central figure who... That's one of the things about the speech, actually, is a way when, when we talk about well, why is it remembered... The history doesn't just go through and decide, well, what's the best speech? Who is the best organizer? It, right. it actually selects these things with, with great prejudice. So Rustin says, who's going to follow him? Nobody wants to follow King. So then the question becomes how long he's going to speak. And uh, Roy Wilkins, the head of the NAACP, says, I will cut your mic off if you go over the five-minute limit that we all have. He tells, he tells Dr. Tells King this? I will cut his mic off. <laughs> wow. So they was regulating on King like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And King, the night before, was very upset. Why, you know, why the Was King like some sort of, uh, was he some egotistical cat or? Well, uh, I mean, he had an ego like the rest of them. He wasn't particularly ego, ego maniacal. But there was a resentment because, first of all, King, even though by that stage he was in his 30s, he represented a new generation of activism. 
<clears throat> Wilkins and those, they were, their center of activism was go through the courts, go through the legislators. King was, um, had taken the direct action to a new level. Okay. And where he went, the cameras followed, and they resented that too. Mm. Um, I mean, they wanted it, they needed it, but they also resented it. And this was a big day. This was the biggest of days. All the networks were going to cover this in a way that they hadn't even been able to maybe two or three years before. International coverage. James Farmer, who did not attend the, uh, the march because he was in jail in Louisiana, he said to me that was the biggest mistake he ever made was wow. not attending. I spoke to him shortly before he died, and he said the biggest mistake he made was not uh, bailing himself out of jail and speaking in March because that was his chance for a global audience. And we should also remind people, and if you're just uh, tuning in on radio or watching on TV, we're talking with author Gary Young about his new book, The Speech, The Story Behind Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream Speech. We should uh, also remind folks there were several marches on Washington prior to that, but this was the big one. I think people also mm. forget that folks right. had done this before, well, and but, but never to the scale. Never to the scale. And, and actually, A. Philip Randolph who was the brains behind the march. In a way, Bad Rustin was a muscle. He was the organizational muscle, but it was A. Philip Randolph's idea. He had called for a march in 1941 mm -hmm. to integrate the military um, uh, economy. And he'd called it off when FDR had acceded to all of his demands. Okay. But, um, so King goes into his room that night thinking, I've only got five minutes. What am I going to do? And he, he's got two metaphors. One is the dream thing, which they told some him key not to people do. have said don't do. One is the uh, uh, this thing about America having passed a bad check to the Negro, that they promised them equality, and it hasn't happened. So this is the famous uh, speech, and if we're on radio, we'll play it, mm. um, where he's talking about... Um, you cast a bad check, insufficient yeah. funds. Yes. That's yes. the thing that a lot of people forget about. Right, exactly. And it's not known as the bad check speech. I mean, it could be, but it's not. And therein lies the story. So uh, he sends the speech off to be typed up, 4 o'clock in the morning. He goes to bed. I have a dream is definitely not in the speech. The guy who wrote the draft, Clarence Jones, says that he knows that King it was not in his mind to do that at the time. The next day they go and they're visiting senators, they go to Capitol Hill. There's an interesting bit in the morning where um, the march is supposed to start at maybe 10 or 11, I can't remember which one, but people just get restless and they start early. And the leaders are in these limousines coming away from Congress and they get stuck because the march has already started. And they say, we're supposed to be leading them. So they have to jump out of the limousines and they run to catch up with the march, which is kind of symbolically nice. King is bothering away at this speech all the way through the day. He's crossing things out, he's putting things in, in between kind of <clears throat> marching, talking to congressmen and so on. He gets to the podium. And, and what was the purpose of the march? Was it for jobs? That's jobs it, and freedom. Jobs, jobs and, and freedom. freedom. It started off as just jobs, and then after Birmingham it became jobs and freedom. They had to incorporate civil rights. Right, into and this of course, knowing that Meg Evers had been killed and all that, so right. everything is ratched up. Yeah. So um, uh, by the end of spring, the civil rights component is central to it. He gets to the podium. He's a 16th speaker that day. All that's left after him, I think, is the benediction right. and something else. Now, now before day. we even get to this, the thing that also caught me, because in this book there's so many jewels, you talk about the fact that the press... And, and I think it's important that we kind of know this because they do this to this day. Mm. Had, in 1963, we're running around going, there's nobody here. So they were already trying to undercount who was going to come. And you, you talk about how they were badgering Bayard Rustin yeah. after with all the people, and they thought that nobody was going to show up. That's right. On the morning of the march, um, there's this, what ends up being a funny moment because Bayard Rustin is such a kind of theatrical and brilliant character, where Rustin goes out for a walk on the Washington Mall <clears throat> and there's nobody there. I mean, and there shouldn't be anyone there, really, but um, but there are reporters there and they're saying to him, what's this going to mean? What if nobody shows up? Maybe nobody's going to come. They had kind of pitched it at 100,000 people is what they hoped for. And uh, they're saying to him, um, 
um, they're assuming failure in their questions. Right. And they want him to respond to that. And Rustin takes out a piece of paper and a pocket watch. And he looks at the paper and he looks at the watch and he says, gentlemen, everything is right on schedule. And he puts them back. And later it transpires that piece of paper is completely blank. Mm -hmm. uh, they felt that they were secure and that they, they knew from the people who'd signed up for buses and things how many people would come. But anybody who's organized anything like a demonstration or a meeting knows that you never really know until they show up. Right. So, um, uh, yes, the press was very, very eager to discount the march and very eager to assume that there would be violence. Right. Uh, which, 1963. Yes. They were predicting <laughs> violence. Yes. Because King and them were, were, they were thugs, they had sagging pants. This is for Don Lemon, <laughs> yeah. you know, on CNN, because, you know, like, if you wear sagging pants, you're going to be violent. Uh, well, obviously. I bring that up because <laughs> one of the things about King was that he always wore a baggy suit. And they mm. used to get on him about his suit not fitting. So King <laughs> wore the baggy suit, but there was no violence. There was no violence. Okay. The, only, the only people arrested that day, I think there were two arrests that day, and they were both white people. But they locked that city down like it was... Uh, like it was Fort Knox or like it actually like it was Louisiana after Katrina you know when wow. they just kind of police it like it's a kind of failed state right um, uh, so King comes to the podium and he pretty much is giving the speech it's pretty clear after a couple of minutes that he's going to go over time and he does go way over time it takes about three three times as long as he's supposed to uh, history forgave him for that right but um uh he, he's mostly giving the speech that's in the text. And Clarence Jones, who wrote the text, said this was one of the first times that he can remember that King was actually faithful to the text that he'd set out. And then there comes a moment, and when you listen to the speech, you can hear it. He's winding down. He says, go back to Mississippi, go back to South Carolina, go back to, your, uh, to the northern ghettos, and behind him is Mahalia Jackson. Now, no women were allowed to speak on the platform that day, but Mahalia Jackson had sang, I've been buked, I've been scorned. So they deliberately said no women? Uh, they, they, they didn't forbid women to speak. Somehow it just never happened. Okay. Actually, on the official roster, Mary Avers is down to speak after some pressure. No Fannie Lou Hamer? No, no, none of them? No. Wow. Ma Mary Evers is down on the official, uh, and I'm not sure why she couldn't come, but that was after significant pressure. So what they did was they had a tribute to Negro women, Rosa Parks, uh, Daisy Bates, uh, I can't remember the others, there were a few, were asked to come up and take a bow. But I didn't say anything. No, Destiny Nash and none of them people. No. I mean, not, um, not, not, not Diane Nash. Diane Nash, Diane Nash actually, t um, I, I spoke to her about Diane it. Diane Nash, Freedom Rider. Well, Freedom Rider. Freedom Rider. She did not go to the march because she was burnt out. She was like, this is a good time. Her and James Bevel, her partner, decided that they would organize for people to go, and then they would stay at home. Mm. <coughs> so, um, um, Mahalia Jackson is sitting behind him, and um, when he's winding down, she was at a demonstration in Detroit where he used the dream sequence, and she says, tell him about the dream, man, tell him about the dream. So if we listen real carefully on some of the recordings, We'll hear her go, tell him about the dream. I have never actually heard her say that. Okay. Clarence Jones, so I've never heard that. It doesn't come through on the recordings. Okay. Clarence Jones heard her. Right. Edward Kennedy heard her. <coughs> uh, a few other people heard her. And Jones says King must have heard her because she was closer to King than she was to him. Right. And King and Jackson had this very intimate relationship because she was his favorite gospel singer and he would call her whenever he was down for some gospel therapy. Right. And she would sing to him. But it doesn't appear that he hears her this time. And so he carries on. Go back to your northern ghettos and know that somehow this will be cured. And this is all in the speech. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And then she shouts again. And then in Clarence Jones's words, King put the text to the left. And in his demeanor, he changes from a lecturer to a preacher. <coughs> and Jones turns to the person sitting next to him and says, these people don't know it, but they're about to go to church. Wow. The dream starts. 
I'm going to take a break, play a little bit of the speech, let him get a drink of water, and we're going to come back and conclude. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And this momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, The, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We're back here listening to a little bit of Dr. Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream. You know, um, we were talking the other day, and there's a few things that come to mind around this speech. You know, you painted a picture in 1963 and all that's going on, and we talk about how this speech becomes immortalized. One of the things that <coughs> I can't help thinking about when we were talking about this is the presence of Malcolm X. Mm. You know, 1963 is also the year in November after King, you know, gives a speech that King, that X gives his um, message, message to the grassroots. Oh, right, yes. But the other thing, and this is what I forgot to uh, ask you when we were talking, the day that Mega Evers was killed, uh, uh, Wyatt Walker mm -hmm. from the SCLC and James Farmer have a huge debate with Malcolm X that day. You know, oh, 1963, wow. That that the, the the day that uh, 
uh, Eggers is killed. Mm. And King, you know, X is <coughs> going in. And, and if people want, they can check this out on YouTube. Mm. But, you know, that debate, you know, Malcolm's going in on him. He's mm. like, yo, letting him have it. Like, what kind of country is this? We can't be doing this. And he's smashing on him about the upcoming march. And I bring this up to ask, did the presence of Malcolm, you know, move them in a particular direction? Where they Did they have to be aware of you know, where he and people who are thinking like him were coming from, because I'm not sure if it was you, but from what I was, you know, mm. there was control of that mic. Like, th I think you said that yeah. if anybody came up there and said anything Malcolm X-like, they were going to turn on a, a song. Can you talk a little bit about this? Well, right. The, the big fear that the state had was that there would be violence. Right. And so <clears throat> one of the things they did, unbeknownst to the march organizers, was have a switch on the mic, a kill switch. Now, who's they? The, 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 the government. The, the government did? Mm. No. Like Kennedy and company? Yeah, the, yeah. I can't remember which department of the government, but they had a kill switch. I mean, this is now, now. Right. It's not kind of, I'm not just making it up, is what I mean. Right. And the idea was that if anybody said anything insurrectionary from the podium, they would kill the mic and uh, they had a copy of Mahalia Jackson singing He's Got a Whole World in His Hands, ready to go. No way. And they were going to play Mahalia Jackson. So the government did this and didn't even let the march organizers know this. Mm. So they, um, yeah, so they had a kill switch there. Wow. Um, but um, Malcolm X was always there in the wings. He's always there in the wings. He, and when he's not there... Sometimes he's there physically. I mean, around the march, he's in D.C., Roaming around the... Um, so King is there. I mean, ex Malcolm is in D.C. the day of the march. He's in D.C. He's in, he's in, but he doesn't go to the march. Right. But he's in the foyer of the hotel kind of holding court, calling it a picnic. Kind yeah. Of, you know, he was um, this, but, ridiculing, ridiculing well, people. But then he goes to Oss Ossie Davis's room. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that night, Ossie Davis, who organized the celebrity contingent that came to the march, Right, and he goes to Ossie Davis's room, and he just says, "Look, I'm here if you need me. If anything happens and you need me for anything, I am here. There's the things that I say to the press, and there's the things that, um, you know, there's my public position. But if you need me, this is the night before I am here. Meaning, like the fruits of Islam and all that. If they need protection <coughs> and that whole thing, if they need someone to, Malcolm X was strategically savvy." And he understood that even though a march, a, uh, a multiracial march on Washington or in Washington was not the way he would go, that it would set the cause back if it was seen to be a failure. Right. And the nation was, if nothing else, an extremely disciplined outfit. I mean, the one thing that the nation, for all of its talk of nation, not of, Islam. nation yeah. of Islam, for all of the ways in which Malcolm was attached to the notion of violence as opposed to nonviolence, the nation has never been associated with violence, apart from in internecine struggles with its own members. Right. I mean, there's never, you can't point to a kind of single thing that the nation has done that has been particularly violent. They're a highly disciplined group of, uh, you know, cater right. of people. So, um, uh, he's saying to Ossie Davis, basically, we need this to be a success. Right. Uh, it's not going to help me if this fails. It's not going to help us if this fails. And then maybe he can, if maybe if things did kick off, maybe Malcolm X could have come and he could have appealed to the crowd in a way that King did not appeal to the crowd. But all through that year, there was a meeting, I think, uh, sometime earlier in 63, where King is speaking in Harlem and the crowd. Bits of the crowd start heckling him and shouting, we want Malcolm. Right. In John Lewis's autobiography, he talks about how Malcolm X was becoming more and more popular. So he was a threat to the civil rights movement because it meant that, particularly their appeal to nonviolence. Right. That his appeal, and even Rosa Parks said, I'm much more of a Malcolm X kind of gal than a, right. than a, Martin. Than, than a Martin Luther King.
Well, it's interesting <coughs> because, you know, we know the message to the grassroots, and he digs, he goes mm. in hard on mm. that march. Uh, but also that, that conversation they have the day that Mega Everest dies, he's, he's, he's slanging them. You know, if this was a rap battle, King mm. is letting both of them, you know, have it. But the, the thing that also I remember, and also you find this on YouTube, you talked about the celebrity contingent is um, there's a round table with Marlon Brando, Charleston Heston, Sidney Poitier, mm -hmm. uh, Harry Belafonte. Mm -hmm. And seeing all those guys sit in this round table and talk about <coughs> the march mm -hmm. is just incredible. Like, you know, like, like I often like to tell people, if you want to see like Harry Belafonte, like when he's at his prime, mm -hmm. like listen to him talk and he's using words like, white supremacy and pushing it back and Marlon Brando is mm. smashing hard about what type of governments we need to have and even um, uh, uh, Charleston Heston is 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 rolling mm. pretty deep so just the level of political awareness is is you know just unbelievable and when I'm looking at your book and then I'm looking at these speeches I'm like man this is a this is a time for the ages yeah no it's a very um, it's a crucial and pivotal time in uh, in American politics and the Kennedy's advisors are saying this it has not been worse since the Civil War that's how pivotal it is right like you know either we keep it together or we don't right. and that's kind of that's what's at stake and I mean what's interesting looking at things like Birmingham like Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door is that fundamental questions of power are raised right. who has it who wants it? Who needs it? Who has power but no influence? Who has influence but no power? Right. And uh, I think it's Hannah Arendt who I quote in the book as saying, revolutionaries, she says, the revolutionaries aren't people who take pa power, they're people who find it lying in the street and right. not to pick it up. And that's what you have in that moment in 63. Is it federal? Is it state? Is it local? Is it black? Is it white? Right. Is it the civil rights movement? Is it the base? Is it the leadership? Is it the is it Kennedy? Is it the Southern Democrats? It's all up for grabs. And the other thing too, you know, when we think about why this speech is <coughs> the test of time, in your opinion, is it because King gave more militant, more pro, um, provocative speeches, because you said this isn't his best speech. Um, it's the <coughs> one that we remember him best by, but you know, when he's challenging the Vietnam War, mm. uh, my favorite speech from him is the speech that he gives to radio and television announcers about the role of media, um, you know, the uh, turning a, a brotherhood, a neighborhood mm. into a brotherhood, mm. you know. He's much more, you know, I'm black and I'm proud, kind of moving in, a, in another direction. So it seems like, you know, if you look at King after 63 versus then it's better to highlight that or is it because of the Malcolm <coughs> situation like we better remember King and kind of forget about message to the grassroots uh, no, I think it's the first I think it's the first one I think that um, uh, there are two things going on the first is that this is the last getting rid of codified segregation not racism but codified segregation the signs mm -hmm. is the last great moral act that America has achieved right uh, I can't think of a major moral achievement that this country has made si since then. Um, and this is the most eloquent articulation of that demand. Mm. So there is that. But history doesn't just choose the best ones. It has to be in some way convenient. Now, you can't remember, between 63 and 68, the speech is very rarely referred to, actually. And, really? then, and then King is assassinated. So during the t so when he's alive, <coughs> that's not really that, that speech ain't the, the the bar setter. No, no, and um, I haven't met anybody who knew him who was involved in the civil rights movement who thought at the time that that was going to be the speech for the ages. I asked them all, "Did you think we'd still be talking about this speech in fifty years' time?" And they're like, "No." I mean, it was a good speech, but he always did good speeches. And wow, no, it wasn't. It wasn't, you know. They're not saying it wasn't good. They were saying we didn't realize that it was anything special until much later. What happens after 68? Or well, between 63 and 68, the Civil Rights Act is passed. The Voting Rights Act is passed. King starts talking about poverty, about class, 
and he starts talking about the Vietnam War. He calls America the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. And then he is assassinated. And, he, and he's not very popular. Though. And he's not very popular when he's assassinated. He's, um, uh, by 66, is twice as many people, Americans, disapprove of him as approve. And if you think that that's not weighted for race, then that's basically 89% of white people don't right. like him. I remember I was talking with Jeremiah Wright, you know, who's around the obviously at that time, and he was saying, <coughs> that, you know, amongst the churches mm. that he had lost significant popularity. Like yeah. many people who are claiming that they were, they love mm. King by the time he was dead, especially after he gave that speech, it was like, nah, we're not real. That's yeah. not the guy anymore. They weren't, yeah. they were upset with him. Exactly. So then there's, then there's a question of how you remember him once he's dead. Well, you can't remember him as the man who spoke out against America's violent uh, 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 foreign policy because he still has a violent foreign policy. Right. You can't remember him as the guy who called for government intervention to help the poor and for class politics to uh, force a reckoning with issues of poverty because that still hasn't happened. But you can remember him as a man who spoke out against the one thing that the country did and that who did it on that day. And even if most people, most white people in particular, did not support the end of segregation in that way at that time, they thought everything was going too fast and so on and so forth. Nonetheless, once it had gone, they came to support him in the same way that white South Africans came to support Mandela. Right. Because they had no choice, and the world that they feared was actually better than the one that they came from. Right. And so... Um, so it's the most convenient way to remember King, and there is something in that speech for everybody. Yeah, It's a dream rooted in the American dream. He's standing at the foot of the Lincoln Memorial. He talks about the founding fathers. He um, is delivered in a black vernacular. It's a, it's a Baptist And he also delivery. reminds you that it's the 100th anniversary it's of the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation. Proclamation. Right. He, he calls America out on his racism. You can take any bit of that speech, and you can be Glenn Beck, as Glenn Beck did, and you can um, uh, hold a rally on the anniversary of the speech and say that it cloak yourself in King. You can be Barack well, Obama. Ron, Ronald Reagan. You can be Ronald Reagan. You can be Barack Obama, who takes the Democratic nomination on the 45th anniversary of the speech, but then doesn't mention King by name. Yeah. Uh, uh, in a sense, the breadth of his appeal and this comes back to your first question, in a way, or, or one of your first questions. The breadth of the appeal, in a sense, is undermined by a lack of depth, if you like. Mm. That he, it's not that it's a shallow speech, but that uh, it's a speech that appeals to everybody, or t by casting his net wide, he doesn't cast it as deep. And so anybody can take anything that they want from that speech right. and say, and then, and then uh, cloak themselves in King's memory. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But that is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice in the process of gaining our rightful place. We must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protests to degenerate into physical violence again and again. We must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. And the marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community 
must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. And they have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied. As long as our body is heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I am not my unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friend, <laughs> so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, 
will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. And every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain. And the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day with all of God's children be able to sing with new meaning my country tears of thee sweet land of liberty of thee i sing land where my fathers died land of the pilgrims pride from every mountainside let freedom ring and if america is to be a great nation this must become true and so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of new hampshire let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, and when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. The name of the book is The Speech, the story behind Dr. Luke, Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. The author is Gary Young. I want to thank you thank for you. being on here. One last thing, you know, mm. briefly. How much did hip-hop and the fact that so many of us coming up in the 80s and in the 70s would play King over rap beats for such a long time? King and X are often mm. played and often sampled. Did that help keep and immortalize that alive? Well, you know, his even with house because you're yeah. in Chicago, King speeches are often played behind house beaches. I mean, here's house, house beats, <laughs> and, and I wouldn't be able to answer that specifically. But here's what I can say is that <clears throat> it would have been much more convenient for America to forget King, mm. and so remembering him to the extent that we do. In 1999, only Mother Teresa was more popular was a more popular person from the last century than King. Wow. That was not obvious in 68. And that doesn't happen by accident. 
countries like America don't decide to remember black radicals because they decide to love them. Yeah. And so uh, every effort, Stevie Wonder, Happy Birthday, or the Federal Holiday, or the Rap Beats, um, every little thing, every teacher who insisted on it being in their curriculum has kept it going. Well, and it's, it's, it's kept it going until it's got to a point where the country, there's a critical mass of people in the country who are comfortable, sufficiently comfortable with the memory. But it doesn't happen by accident. If it did, there'd be statues to black people all over the place, and there aren't. That's real talk. The speech, as we remember the 50th anniversary, Dr. King, the uh, 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, the 40th anniversary of hip hop, many people have forgotten that, you know, and we're the generation that comes after the civil rights generation, so that's something to mark. But I want to thank Gary Young for really capturing a lot of gems, and we only touched the surface. We didn't talk about the death of Kennedy also happening in 63. Uh, there are so many things. Cassius that, Clay yeah, becomes Cassius, Muhammad yeah, Ali just a year right. later. Yeah, so there's a lot of things going on. Um, around this, and he captures this in his book. So, thank you, Gary. Once Thanks again. very much, David. Thanks for uh, having me. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back. <laughs> 